Hello, I'm Wendy Brockman, and welcome to Denver Decides. This community partnership is dedicated to accessible and transparent elections. The partnership includes the League of Women Voters of Denver, Interneighborhood Cooperation, and is presented by Denver 8 TV. Our mission today is to present a candidate forum in anticipation of the general election coming up on Tuesday, November 6th. Among other offices, this election includes the candidates vying to represent constituents in Colorado State House District 1. House District 1 is located in southwest Denver. So our format includes timed opening and closing statements from each of the candidates. That will be followed by rounds of questions that have been submitted by the organizers of the forum. Mm. Since we do have a time limit, we may not be able to get to all of the submitted questions. All of the candidates will answer all questions and all of their responses will be timed. Our timers are out front where the candidates can see them. So let's begin by meeting the candidates vying to represent Colorado State House District 1 as your next representative. The candidates on stage are left to right facing the audience in the order that their names will appear on the November ballot. So beginning at my left is Susan Lantine. And on Ms. Lantine's left is Alicia Padilla. And next to Ms. Padilla is Daryl Dingus. Let's welcome the candidates to our forum. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. One more note to the candidates on behalf of the forum, organizers, the audience here, and our audience at home. We sincerely urge you to be honest, direct, and forthright to help our voters distinguish one candidate from another. All right, we will begin with one minute opening statements from each candidate, and we will proceed in ballot order. So starting at my left, Susan Lantine, we'll begin with your opening statement. You have one minute. Thank you, and thank you to my opponents for joining me tonight at this forum put on by Denver Decides and Denver Channel 8. My name is Susan Lantine, and I am the current state representative for House District 1 and have lived in the district since 1998. I think it's important for voters to know my values as they are the bedrock for my work at the Capitol. I believe that everyone should have access to affordable health care, so I have spent my time as your elected representative working on issues related to health care, access, affordability, and patient safety. I believe that when our children have a good education, we are all better for it. That is why I have worked on issues that have ensured that all children have access to a quality education and why I support public education and continue to advocate for more funding for our public schools. I believe that when women can join, can plan for their families and make their own choices about their bodies, they, then they will have stronger families and we will have less reliance on public assistance and greater opportunities to succeed. All right, your time is up and now we have an opening statement from Alicia Padilla. Hello, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for this debate. I know it took a lot of time and hard work to put this event on. Uh, my name is Alicia Padilla and I'm the Republican candidate for House District 1. I truly do believe in government of the people, for the people, and by the people. It may not fit the status quo of a candidate, but I am here to listen and fight for the people of Colorado. As a Colorado native, I have seen what is going on at our Capitol and it doesn't appear to be in the best interest of the people. I believe, protecting, I believe in protecting your constitutional rights. The decisions that are made about your home should be based on your decisions and not based off of laws created in a building downtown. I will make legislation based off common sense and not off of emotions. I am willing to respectfully cross the aisle and have serious discussions with other legislators to come up with real answers to problems that face Colorado. I would be honored to represent the people of House District 1. It's time we give the people their voice back, regardless of thank, party affiliation. Thank you, Ms. Padilla. Finally, the opening statement from Daryl Dingus. Hi, <clears throat> Hi I'm Daryl Dingus. I'm the Libertarian candidate for, for this State House office. Uh, I was born in Denver, attended West High School, and went to Colorado School Mines, got an engineering degree, ended up working for the Colorado DOT for over 25 years. So I Hope I know a little thing about transportation, being an engineer. I was a standard engineer for CDOT. So the, th the things I did had impacts statewide, especially guardrail and was one of the major issues. And we had a lot of, lot of issues, but we worked through them and we got the job done. We had the saying in CDOT, get her done. And if you send me to the legislature, I hope I'll, we have some issues, I can get in there and get her done and 
get things straightened up, and I'm sure everybody on there has been doing what they best they could, but there's always better ways to do things. We've learned that a lot with my experience at CDOT. The way, way we did it maybe 20, 30 years ago, new technology comes up and all that, everything changes, methods change, and you do things. Thank you, Mr. Dingus. Your time is up. Now we're gonna to move to questions, guys, okay? Our first question for the candidates, and each candidate will have one minute to answer, and we will start in reverse order from the opening statement, so we will begin with Daryl Dingus. Here's your first question. What do you see as the biggest challenge within your own district, and what will be your plan of action to resolve the issue? Well, I think for some people, housing prices could be a big issue that they've jumped. If you're particularly if you're a renter, if you own the house, it's less of an issue, but your property tax could still be moving up. So that's the number one issue. Now, if you drive around our districts, probably not that bad as far as traffic. But if you're going to try and go downtown or go anywhere, anywhere in the, in the Denver metro, it's like it almost takes what used to take a half hour seems to take an hour now. So I think traffic is really a big issue. And I think that affects everything. Like even if you were, you had to get to the hospital, it might slow down the ambulance or something like that. And I, if people are delivering, trucks are delivering groceries to the store, everything's relying on transportation. And we need to do whatever we can to get, get Colorado moving on a transportation mode. And there's plenty of other issues, but I, those two I think have a definite impact. All right, let's turn to Alicia Padilla for her answer to that question. Uh, I'll agree with Daryl. Transportation is a huge problem. Uh, it does take a great deal of time to not only get your kids to school, to get to work, if there's an emergency, uh, not only with the backflow of traffic. You know, we're going down our streets trying to get to work, and at the same time we're damaging our vehicles, which is costing us more money, all because it feels like we're four-wheel driving, for example, on the right lane going down Sheridan. So infrastructure is, by, is definitely something that's a huge issue in our area. Susan Lantine, your answer to the question. Well, I think my opponents raised two things that are definitely um, of importance in our district. Affordable housing has been a huge problem with Denver's um, growing population, and um, people are starting to discover Southwest Denver. We've been relatively affordable to the rest of the city, but our housing prices are definitely um, starting to creep up, and it's really hard for our young families to be able to afford to stay in the city. Um, one of the things that we have been trying to work on is to try to figure out how we can make housing more affordable for these young families. I would also say that transportation has been a problem. Certainly um, support the um, ballot initiative that we have. Um, coming up this November, which would go a long way to help supporting it with dedicated funding to help us be able to repair infrastructure and build new project projects. Also, right. um, no, nope, you, you're fine. You can. Oh, and we just got your stop. Okay. All right. Let's begin our second question for the candidates, and we're going to begin with Miss Padilla. If you could change one current Colorado law, what would it be, and how would you change it, and why? Um. Well, I'm a big supporter of TABOR. However, our legislation has found a way to work around TABOR. Where TABOR is, as many know, our Taxpayer Bill of Rights, it allows the voters to decide whether or not their taxes are increased and where that money is going. However, our legislation has found a way to work around that, and that is the thing that they're calling fees. I don't know, um, everybody has to renew their license, their license plates every year. Next time you do, look at that little slip that you get and how many of those charges are fees compared to how much your registration really is. So right, that Ms. would... Ms. Lunty? Um, sure. Um, since we were talking about affordable housing, um, Mr. Dingus is right that it's not just buying a house, it's also our rent is increasing. And one of the things we have in, um, in law is a prohibition uh, across the state to allow... Um, districts to um, uh, implement rent control. Now, not every air part of the state needs this, but some areas are more expensive than others. And so I would like to look at making it permissive for our uh, municipalities to be able to uh, allow for that. Mr. Dingus? Uh, I'd probably ch look at the construction defect law because that, I believe that was passed some years back 
and it's really shut, almost shut down building of condos and multifamily housing for purchase. It hasn't shut it down for rent prices, but for purchases, it's almost shut down building condos. And I particularly as you move towards the more crowded areas like downtown, Cherry Creek and that, a lot of people would like to buy a house, but if nobody's building, or buy a condo, but if nobody's building them, or you can't buy what ain't out there. But I would like to see a lot of people have the opportunity to move into a property that they own as opposed to a property they rent, whether that's owned by a government or controlled by a government or controlled by a corporation that could be based in, who knows, Florida or something. All right, Ms. Lantine, you will be first to answer our next question. Who are the major contributors to your election campaign? Well, I'll be honest, I've gotten support from some of our unions, including teachers and our um, electrical workers unions. Um, I've also gotten con contributions from friends and family, although those are smaller contributions. I will say that the contributions I have received um, from what some may call special interests are in line with my personal values. So um, I don't feel uncomfortable with taking the votes that I have because I feel they're very much in line with where I, my values lay. Mr. Dingus, your answer. Uh, that's a simple question for me. It's me. I'm just self-funding. As of to date, I think I spent 54 bucks. I created a website, did some business cards, and i just been out meeting people. I passed out some lit some libertarian literature to people that is paid for, that doesn't have my name on it, it's paid for the party, and we go to various events and we try and convince people that maybe the libertarian's a good option for them. I won't tell them how to vote, but I'll let them know that there's another option out there. Very good. Ms. Padilla? Uh, two Republican Party organizations, and then friends, which include veterans. They know um, I'm a big supporter of them. Also a retired fire department captain. They know I'm a very, uh, it's very important that our first responders have all of the tools that they need necessary in order to go to the calls and be effective when they do. All right, now you have had a chance to answer three of the questions and listen to your opponent's answers as well. So each of you will now be given 30 seconds for a follow-up. So you can add to one of your answers if you like, or you can comment on one of the answers given by your opponent. It's your time for comment and is not for questions, though. All right, Mr. Dingus, you have 30 seconds. Um, I'd like to focus on the transportation. I'd like to eventually see some sort of higher speed rail or something that could move people maybe from all the way from Pueblo to Fort Collins on a rail track or maybe even some of this put them in a tube latest technology and then eventually build it build it all the way up to Vail. Now I understand this might need private funding, maybe the state can kick in some. It may be maybe a long term 20, 30 years from now before it's completely built out, but if we don't start the ball rolling. Okay. Turn your times up. Apologize, Miss Dia, you have thirty seconds. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to bring up rent control, although it's a nice idea. However, the government should not be able to tell property owners um, how much they can charge for people to stay in their homes. In addition to that, with rent control, um, we've got a lot of initiatives on the ballot to increase taxes. So one kind of contradicts the other. If we have rent control but people are out taxed from living here, it won't really work. Ms. Lantin, you have 30 seconds for a follow-up. Thank you. I would like to address an issue raised by Ms. Padilla regarding uh, Tabor. Uh, since Tabor was passed in 1992, we have um, seen a serious detriment to our um, school funding, um, transportation funding, and general funds for the state. I know that people look at our general fund budget and see that it has grown, but it's also been a part, a function of the number of people we have moving here. I would say that the... Your time is up. Thank you. Now let's continue with questions for our candidates vying for the State House of Representatives seat, District 1. Ms. Padilla, you will answer first. Do you think there is a role for the state legislature to play in matters involving the Denver Police Department or the Denver Sheriff's Department? Uh, I believe uh, 
financially there is in order to, again, come up, give them the tools that they need to um, go to first, you know, respond to calls. Um, Ms. Lantine, yes. you have one minute. I would say that um, one of the biggest tools that we could help with is our 911 system and make sure that it runs as effectively as possible so that our first responders can get to calls as soon as they can. That We do have some work that needs to be done there. Um, and also, uh, we need to make sure that our Denver police are respecting the civil rights of our citizens. Um, but funding in those functions are really pretty much for the city. Mr. Dingus, your turn. Um, I'd like to see the Denver County Sheriff being elected like it is in, say, Arapahoe County where the sheriff is elected. I think that would make the, the sheriff more responsive to the citizens of Denver because if he knew he was up for election every f four years or something, and I couldn't say it would 100% make things better, but at least you'd have a voice on who your sheriff was. All right. Now, question number five from our sponsoring partners, and we will begin with Susan Lantin. What is your highest priority in legislation you would introduce or support should you be elected? So a couple things that I'm working on for this coming legislative session, I guess you could put them as my priorities. Um, one of them is to continue to try to look at why our health care is so expensive. Um, and we think it's expensive here, but it's even more expensive for our fellow citizens in the Western Slope regions. So I'm looking at a couple of different things that we can do that are really pretty simple that we could um, already attach to what the state already has um, to help out our folks on the Western Slope. Um, we also looked at some issues around reinsurance um, and um, a public option study to see what it would take to do that um, as a plan for uh, folks on the individual market to plan to buy. To Daryl Dingus, what is your highest priority in legislation you would introduce or support? I would focus on, focus on transportation. Um, I'd say we've made some toll, toll roads or toll lanes, and the, the company that build them and manage them is maybe based in Italy or some European country. I think we could do that in Colorado. We could set up some sort of corporation or something where like E470 was based in Colorado, where we could sell even sell bonds and people people that lived in Colorado could invest in transportation and then we could build the facility and then those people that invest would get a rate of return on that facility. Because CDOT themselves probably don't have the money to really build a brand new road. I mean they're stretched thin on their money. Ms. Padilla, your highest priority in legislation? Accountability. We have billions more dollars coming into this state at this point, yet we want to turn, ask voters for more of their money. Uh, last legislation, the legislators did vote and approve to increase funding to education for this year. I just find it odd that when I went to my daughter's back to school night, one of the topics that was discussed was budget cuts to the programs. A little confused how they received more money, but there's budget cuts. All right, now the next question for our candidates. Mr. Dingus, you will begin the answers for this round. You'll have a minute. Give one or two ideas by which you think the state legislature can reduce homelessness. Um, first, I think part of it's due to people moving to Colorado that, well, we legalize marijuana and somebody jumps on a bus and they move here and, oh, it's a pretty neat place. And now, well, but the rent's so high, you can't find that. Now, it's for the people that have been here long term, we could maybe find some programs to help them. Uh, I mean, the long-term goal would be to get these people into their house that they own and assume they have a decent job, they could be buying their house. Now for the chronic homeless, you know, there's probably a ton of issues why that's, why that's handled and there's charities that work in it. Maybe the state's got some role in that, that issue. But for people that are just priced out based on, they're working and they're price, priced out based on economic issues, I think we could do something on that. The key would be maybe building some affordable houses. Maybe they'd be smaller houses, maybe even like a dorm room for people so they'd have a roof over their head. And I think it's a complex issue, but. Ms. Padilla, one or two ideas by which you think the legislature can reduce homelessness? 
Um, homelessness is near and dear to my heart. My daughters and I um, like to volunteer to serve the homeless, and we do take the time to talk to them to hear their concerns. Um, there are some great organizations out there that do help um, the homeless. They help them with addictions, uh, mental issues. These are the areas where um, should be focused on, and from there they help them transition into um, basic normal living uh, and help them get into jobs. It's, it's the organizations that are helping these people are the ones we should look at as far as how to improve the situation instead of just throwing money at the situation. Ms. Lantin? I would agree um, that it is a complex issue. Um, and one of the biggest reasons we're finding that for folks that are chronically homeless is mental health and substance abuse, which both of my opponents have raised. Um, it is an issue that we have begun to take very seriously at the state capitol um, to make sure that people who receive, uh, who are um, addicted to different things are getting the help that they need and not just to um, in the short term, but they're also going to need long-term support um, to make sure that they maintain their sobriety and are able to function as well as they can and to be able to get a job and have a roof over their head. So substance abuse and mental health would be the two biggest things we could do. Okay. Now we're going to do another follow-up round where you will each have 30 seconds to, if you want to expand on something you've said or if you... Um, want to respond to something that one of your opponents has said. So Mr. Dingus, we'll start with you, 30 seconds. I guess I'll go back to transportation because that's something I know. I mean, I could learn about other subjects, but something I know. And, and right now we pay based on gas tax as a primary source of it. But when you, cr when you have electric cars, that car is really not gonna pay a gas tax. So you're gonna have to find a new source of, new source of revenue and from say electric cars or hybrids that get higher gas mileage and it, it may eventually have to go like places in Europe when went to electronic tolling and you know pay by the mile. All There's right, thank options. you Mr. Dingus. I'm gonna have to cut you off. I apologize. Uh, Miss Padilla, 30 seconds to follow up on something. I'm uh, Miss Padilla, <laughs> apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'll agree with Daryl that uh, transportation is a big thing. However, um, adding more taxes isn't necessarily the answers or fees. Um, right now, I'll go back to when you renew your plates, there is that fee, the improvement fee, that was supposed to go to improving our roads. And um, I think it goes back to accountability. Where has that money gone ever since they've implemented that fee? I know myself, I haven't seen much more. All right. Thank you. Now, Ms. Lanti. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I would like to just expound on what Ms. Padilla said. Um, she's referring to the faster um, fees that were um, implemented, and I can't remember the date. And those fees have gone to improve our roads and bridges. And they there is a list of projects easily found on CDOT's website that I would be happy to show her um, when I have uh, internet access that lists all those projects. And some of them have been in House District 1. And I know that when I drive under those bridges that have been repaired and are no longer in danger of falling on me, that I feel much safer. All right, now another question for our candidates. Ms. Padilla, you will begin this round. What is your position on fracking and has it changed over time? Um, I am uh, a supporter of fracking. It has changed over time. Uh, there's very minimal chemicals going into the ground, into the ground. They are a lot more safe when they do the fracking. Um, not only when they're going into the ground, also when they have their staff uh, on the drill rigs. There's more health and safety measures that have been implemented, also more environmental uh, um, regulations that have been implemented, which have improved the fracking and oil and gas industry. All right, Ms. Lantine, what is your position on fracking and has it changed over time? You have one minute. Thank you. Um, so. In southwest Denver, we're lucky that we are not impacted by exploration and extraction of um, oil and gas. So we don't see the immediate impacts that some of our neighbors in other parts of the state have seen when they look out their door and see a big rig that is has uh, bright lights on it 24-7 and emits a lot of noxious chemicals and smells and a lot of noise that impacts their daily quality of life. Um, 
I would say, though, that we have to be thoughtful in how we expect our homes to be heated, our lights to come on, because we do depend upon natural gas for our daily activities of living. So I think we need to find a balance to make sure that we are protecting public health and safety, and while also remembering that we depend on that for energy. Mr. Dingus, your position on uh, fracking. I actually took a class at Colorado School of Mines when I was studying petroleum engineering on fracking. But fracking has been done in the U.S. since like the 1940s, and it's been done all over the country, even all over the world. Now, if there's environmental pact, impact to nearby neighbors, noise, that, them issues, that's a secondary issue that need to be addressed. But I think America needs the energy. As long as people want to drive their cars and heat their house, there's got to be a source of energy. You know, unless we can perfect solar or nuclear or something like that to take its place, we need that energy, and it's got to come from somewhere. And maybe the one is people keep sprawling out. Maybe I need to look at urban sprawl. Let's not sprawl the whole city out all over. Maybe the certain areas need to be designated as energy sources until the until they can be developed, and then you can put your residential around that that area. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dingus. All right. You've had the chance to answer a few more questions and listen to your opponent's answers as well. So we're going to do another follow-up segment. So you will each be given one minute for follow-up. You can add to one of your answers or you can comment on one of the answers given by your opponent. The time is yours, but not for asking questions. So we'll continue our rotation and begin with Ms. Lantine. You have one minute. Thank you. I um, feel like I got cut short off um, a little bit on the Tabor issue. It is a huge and complicated issue. It's not just an easy sound bite because it does sound really great when we say that um, we shouldn't increase taxes. But the truth of the matter is that taxes are there for the public good. Um, the public good builds roads, schools, it protects our public health and safety. Um, funds our, uh, our, our fire departments, our police departments, um, pays for all sorts of things. And the reality is we have a lot of people moving here who want to enjoy the Colorado way of life. Unfortunately, we need to be able to figure out how to pay for it. And one of those things we need to do is figure out how we are going to um, talk about Tabor and educate people on the impacts it has on Colorado. Mr. Dingus, it is your turn. You have um, one minute for a follow-up. I'll talk about the medical issue a little bit. I'm not an expert, but my, my daughter, Sheila, is going to medical school now, so I'm getting experience what it takes to go through medical school. But um, anyway, I think the one of the, it's a nationwide problem, not just Colorado. Net one is large corporations are kind of taking it over, and there ain't a lot of competition in certain areas, and the prices have moved up based on, I mean, for example, is medicine, you know, all of a sudden it jumps up two, 300% higher than it was, and that's due to patent laws and things like that, or they tweak the patent a little bit, and then they boost the price. So I think there's a lot of things that could be done, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or even at the state of Colorado level. We could maybe graduate more doctors in Colorado, and then you'd have you'd have more people out there, maybe the cost of going to see the doctor might go down a little bit. I mean, when you go get your muffler fixed, you got tons of shops to go to, but when, you know, if you need something done on you medically, you maybe got limited options. I understand. Thank you. All right, Ms. Padilla, you have one minute for follow-up. Yes, yeah, so I'll go back to fracking. Um, not, it is safer, and it, it was brought up that um, when the drill rigs are, um, are up, there's an issue with noise, lighting. Um, that issue is usually addressed when they're around residential areas. They do put sound barriers up, which is also high enough to cut also um, not only help with the noise, um, it also helps with the lighting and any type of fumes that are released from those sites. All right. Our next round is what we call the lightning round. So our candidates will be asked to answer questions that I ask with a simple yes, no, or pass. All right, so it goes quickly, so listen closely. There's no expanding on it. It's just yes, no, or pass, okay? So we'll go in left to right order as the candidates face the audience. So we're going to start with Ms. Padilla, or with Ms. Lanti. apologize. <laughs> okay, do you plan to vote for the Denver ballot issue to increase the city sales tax to provide funding for mental health? Yes. 
No. No. Should state legislators work at the Capitol longer than five or six months? No. I can't expand. Uh, Physically at the Capitol, like working? No. No. Should fracking be allowed within 501 to 2,500 feet of homes or businesses? No. Yes. Yes. Do you plan to vote for the state ballot issue to increase taxes for funding of public schools? Yes. No. No. Do you currently own or do you plan to own an electric car? No, I don't own a car, an electric car. No. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you plan to vote for the Denver ballot issue to increase the city sales tax to provide funding for parks? No. 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 All right. I need my glasses for this one. The bill Extreme Risk protect Protection Order, also known as the Red Flag Bill, would allow families and law enforcement to seek court orders to remove firearms from a person whose behavior is deemed extremely dangerous to themselves or to others. So if the bill is introduced in the 2019 session, would you support the red flag bill? Yes. No. No. All right. Do you or any family member own a firearm? No. Yes. Pass. Okay. Amendment 64, legalizing the sale of marijuana in Colorado, passed nearly six years ago. Before the law passed or after, have you sampled what the industry has to offer? After. Yes. Was that legal marijuana? Yes. Legalization. Pass. Okay. Should Mile High Stadium be rebuilt somewhere else to make way for more housing development? No. 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 Do you plan to vote for state amendments Y and Z regarding the legislative and con congressional redistricting process? Yes. No. I haven't read them, so I don't know. Do you plan to vote for the state ballot issue to increase setback requirements from homes for new oil and gas developments? Yes. No. No. This is our final question, I believe. Do you get your newspaper, your news from a traditional newspaper that is one printed on paper? <laughs> That's this not a, a yes way. or no. I, yeah. <laughs> I subscribe to the Post, but I get the electronic okay. version. Okay. No. No. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. We'll give you a little leeway on that question. Um, okay. So now we are going to. We're gonna do one-on-one -on -one questions again. So, okay, for the next round, you get to turn your questions to one another, okay? So each of you, each of you will ask your opponent a question and hopefully they will have an answer for you. The rotation continues with Daryl Dingus going first. You have one minute to ask a question. I'll ask Susan Lantine about her support for the red flag issue. There, I believe those bills have really no due process so people could just be randomly accused by your ex-wife's matter or somebody who has it in for you could just say this guy's being loony and they just show up your door and bang it down and you have to turn in whatever you got. So I, I think they don't have due process. What, the reason I wouldn't support them. So um, the red flag bill that we um, considered this um, legislative session did have a due process mm -hmm. system where um, someone um, would report or law enforcement themselves, someone they thought that may be um, a danger to themselves or others who had a gun. And um, that same person who reported, um, within seven days, there would have to be a uh, court appearance in front of a judge where that person would have to recount with evidence what their uh, belief was based on, as well as law enforcement. So um, there was a, a due process system built in. It was not just someone banging on your door and demanding your gun. All right, Ms. Padilla. Um, my question is also to Ms. Lantine. Um, do you believe we should have sanctuary cities? And if so, how is that um, improving the safety of Coloradans? Well, um, I would say that um, 
there really isn't such a thing as a sanctuary city. Um, but we do recognize that everyone, um, not just citizens, but everyone in this country is um, protected by the civil rights of our Constitution and that there have been extensive work, including by the Cato Institute, which is a conservative think tank, that has shown that the rates of crime in immigrant communities is often lower than in non-immigrant communities. So there really isn't any basis in fact that that is a dangerous segment of society. Okay, and you have an opportunity to ask a question. Sure, um, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Mr. Dingus, um, I know that you have extensive experience in transportation issues, and I appreciate that about you because you really have mm -hmm. some good insights. So um, how exactly do you think we should address our congestion? I know you've kind of answered that with the train, but uh, do you, if you have other ideas, and then how do we pay for that? Well, if I could do that, I could be running CDOT, but but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, there, I think there's options. We can look at what's going on around the world. There are cities that are doing this congestion pricing. There's technology out there that can help move things along. I mean, maybe you even set up mini buses and you, you pack more people per vehicle in. I mean, they tried that with carpooling, but there's lots of options out there that could at least, at least make the situation better because I don't think we can be LA and build it out to 12 lanes in each direction. We just don't have the physical space to that. And I, I appreciate the light rail system and maybe that could be improved on and coordinated with other forms of transportation. And that's why I support the, the rail system because I, I just don't think we have the land spaces to build. I mean, it's nice to jump in your car and get where you're going, but if you're packed up in traffic, sitting there for an hour in traffic, what benefit is that compared to say if you're on the light rail and it's just zooming along? That's why I would support light rail. All right, let's continue with the one-on-one -on -one questioning. Ms. Padilla, you may ask a question of one of your opponents. Um, sorry, I thought we could only ask one, so I only prepared one question. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> If you don't have one, that's fine, too. Yeah, we'll pass. Okay. Ms. Lantine, do you have a question? Um, sure. Um, I have a, a question for Mr. Dingus again um, because he uh, did uh, do a candidate introduction, and I had something to look at um, to prepare for tonight. Um, you had mentioned that um, the state was interfering with individual rights, and I uh, was wondering if you could tell me specifically what right do you feel is being currently interfered with? Well, since I like graduated high school years back, I think lots of the states stepped in on a lot of issues compared to the way America run years back. I mean, well, the example, it's not a state issue, but example, the Brady check came in in the 90s. So if you, before that, you didn't have to, you didn't have to submit to all this background check stuff to buy a firearm. I mean, some people say, well, you need that for safety, but I ain't seen murder rates and all that go down that much despite all these new laws. So, I mean, I'm looking, you pass all these laws, what kind of results do you get after the law's in? It's like, if I'm gonna patch a pothole and it comes out the next day, did I do any good? You know, I want the problem fixed 100%. I don't know that just writing more laws is gonna do that. So the more restrictions you put on people, you're just restricting the, the honest, decent people because the outlaws don't give a dang. All right, Mr. Dingus, now you have an opportunity to ask a question. Um, let's see. Oh, on, on the rent control, I mean, that's been tried in other cities, and then it really it really skews the, the property values because if, you, if this guy has rent control and then another city don't, your property, you know, if you own a property, it really affects your value. We need value. a question. Oh, that's why I asked her about that. Okay. So about the property values. Okay. It just seems like it skews the market. It don't really give you new construction. So, so who's your, who are you asking the question to? Okay. <laughs> I figured that. Okay. So um, I would say, first of all, that um, what I would like to do mm -hmm. is to make it permissive mm -hmm. so that our municipalities could make that decision on their own, whether or not they felt that that would help address some of the issues that folks were having being able to afford rents. So that I would make sure that the cities would be able to decide for themselves. Currently, we do not allow 
that. It is a state prohibition on it, mm -hmm. period. So we can't even allow our bigger cities like here in Denver and other places where rent is so high to have any ability to have any um, opportunity to help folks out with that. All right, that brings us to the end of our Q&A segment. Now we're gonna move to closing statements. Each candidate will have a minute and a half for a closing statement. And we will reverse the order from the opening statements, which means we will begin with Mr. Dingus. You have 90 seconds. Well, I think the state over the years has moved into a lot of social issues and they're trying to be basically the sugar daddy to people that don't have good economic means. And I, I just, or trying to provide health care to everybody from, you know, on the taxpayer's dime. And I just don't think that that'll ever end. I mean, because the needs of people, individual people, could mm -hmm. could never end to, to try and bring the low-end person working up to the level of a middle class might never, never be accomplishable. But at the same time they're doing that, I think they're neglecting things like roads and schools, things that we did, we did better 50 years ago on average than we do today. So you've expanded out to all these, these new, call them social justice warriors, whatever the term you want. You span it out into that, those areas, but you've neglected the things that the state of Colorado used to do, used to do pretty well. I mean, we built Glenwood Canyon. That was a known famous worldwide doing that, but I don't think we could build it in today's Colorado. So we wouldn't have the money and we'd say, well, we got to do something else with that. You know, people need who knows what. Now a closing statement from Ms. Padilla. Uh, I wanted to say thank you one more time to the organizers of this debate, and I also want to say thank you to Mr. Dingus and Mrs. Lantine. It's been truly a pleasure, pleasure being here with them. Um, I am a third-generation Colorado native. I've decided to raise my girls in Colorado because of the lifestyle, morals, and beauties that this uh, great state has to offer. This is also why many people uprooted their life to move to Colorado. So um, it's time for somebody to stand up to preserve that quality of life, uh, and I'd appreciate your support in November. Again, my name's Alicia Padilla, website's padillaforcolorado.com. All right, the last closing statement comes from Susan Lontin. You have a minute and a half. Thank you. So I know when you're out there filling out your ballots that you wanna know and hope that your candidate matches your values. And I hope that tonight I've been able to tell you enough about myself that you can decide for yourself whether I am that match for you or not. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my values with you, and I um, want you to know that, understand that the issues I work on and support in my work at the state capitol. And if I'm reelected, I'll continue to work on protecting our civil rights for everybody, protecting our air and water, and making sure that we have access to affordable health care and that our kids are all educated in a way that they deserve and they all have access to great education. And if you want to know more about me, you can go to my website, SusanLontineHD1.com. Right now it's our audience's turn to show a little appreciation for our candidates. Let's thank them. <laughs> Thank you to all three of you for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank we you. hope we have given you a fair look at each candidate vying to represent you in the Colorado State House of Representative from District 1. Our thanks also to the Denver Decides Partners, which include Interneighborhood Cooperation and the League of Women Voters of Denver. Denver Decides is presented by Denver 8 TV. Remember, the election is Tuesday, November 6th. Let your voice be heard. Be sure you're registered and be sure you vote. For complete election information online, go to denverdecides.com. I'm Wendy Brockman. Thank you for joining us.